Paul McCartney and Wings Band on the Run, not only the fifth McCartney album since the Beatles broke up in 1970, but Wings' most successful album, establishing them and Paul McCartney as serious post-Beatles musicians. This story is surprisingly epic, like seriously, I was shocked making this video. It has journeys to faraway lands, violent muggings, and fear, and even a health scare to young Paul McCartney. This is probably going to be one of my most exhilarating videos yet. So today we're going to show you 10 very interesting facts about Paul McCartney's album, Band on the Run. Paul and John always had a healthy competition. Okay, not exactly always, but their brotherly rivalry gave us some of the best music of all time. John had just released Mind Games, which had showstoppers like the titular track Mind Games, Intuition, and Out the Blue, but Mind Games became a hit single. And well, Paul's album did even better. He had two hit singles, Band on the Run and Jet. Those are seriously hard songs for anyone to compete with. The Battle of the Beatles was well underway, and we all benefited smashingly from it. Paul was in top form in the early 70s, specifically 1973 for this album. He had seemed to be on a mission. His band, the most successful rock and roll group ever, then and now, had dissolved in his hands with petty squabbling, addiction, laziness, jealousy, hurt, and just general disinterest in continuing what they started. Paul ferociously dominated the airwaves post-Beatles, intent on proving he could go it alone. After landing the breakout hit Live and Let Die for the James Bond movie, Wings was becoming known across the world as the real deal. However, not all that glitters is gold, and the next part of the story gets wicked real fast. Paul composed most of the songs for this album at his sprawling Hyde Park farm in Scotland, but as we all tend to do, Paul was looking for a change of scenery. Paul and his wife Linda turned from the United Kingdom and got a hold of EMI's list of international recording studios. After some deliberation, Paul chose Lagos in Nigeria to record this incredible album, Paul says. The idea to go to Lagos was originally just to have some fun, but I didn't fancy recording in London. I fancied getting out, and EMI have got studios all over the world, including one in communist China. But because that was so far away, we decided to go to Lagos, because it would be sunny and warm. You ever get that feeling that things are just going to go so wrong, like your hair starts standing up? I wonder if Paul started seeing the signs, because in telling the story, they are everywhere. Merely weeks before leaving for Africa, lead guitarist Henry McCullough decided to leave the band. He wasn't super keen on Paul's leadership style. Paul has been accused of being a bit of a micromanager, which to be completely frank, no one ever says that about Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys or any other eccentric artist. But because Paul is mostly a normal person, he doesn't get to be very particular about his own music. Brian Wilson had Paul himself playing a piece of celery for the Beach Boys song, Vegetable. Don't talk to me about micromanaging. But that event is for another episode. Another reason Henry left was actually kind of different. I'm interested to see what you all think about this because Linda is so well adored of all the Beatles' wives, but Henry said he wasn't super thrilled with Linda's lack of musical ability, saying, trying to get things together with a learner in the group didn't work as far as I was concerned. Kind of makes sense. I'm not super aware of exactly what level of musical competency Linda had, but I can totally get why that might make an issue. We've heard this before, haven't we? Well, Paul got over Henry leaving just fine. No big deal. But then literally an hour before their flight to Lagos, their drummer Denny said he was leaving the band. Talk about cold feet. Linda McCartney recalls saying, Denny rang up five minutes before we were leaving to record in Lagos and just said, hey man, I can't make the trip. I don't think he wanted to go to Africa. I think it was a bit much. But then again, I think everybody should do what they want. That's what we said Wings should be. If anybody fancies leaving, great but they kept pushing and flew all the way to the ancient, beautiful, and often troubled continent of Africa. 
Paul, Linda, Denny, and the esteemed Beatles engineer Jeff Emmerich found themselves in quite a reality check once in Lagos, Nigeria. Paul says, we thought that it would be warm and sunny out in Africa. We thought it would be like a fab holiday place, but it's not that kind of place you go for a holiday. It's warm and tropical, but it's the kind of place you'd have monsoons. We caught the end of the rainy season, and there were tropical storms all the time. There were power cuts too, and loads of insects. It does bother some people, but we're not creepy crawly freaks. Linda doesn't mind lizards, but someone else, for instance, the engineer we took out, who did Sergeant Peppers and Abbey Road. He couldn't stand them, so a couple of the lads put a spider in his bed. It was all like a bit like scout camp. Aw oh, dude, poor Jeff. So off to a rough start to say the least. What is it John Lennon said? Life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans? But for this part of the story, sometimes people are accused of cultural appropriation. The Beatles and many musicians were accused of stealing music from different peoples. This may get us into a little hot water because these kind of topics are quite salacious. But you know, we're all learning how to treat one another with the care and dignity we all deserve. That's just part of being a person. But my understanding of cultural appropriation is when you dress up as an indigenous person. For example, when you're not, just to belittle or make fun of them. Or you paint your skin to look like a different color of human being. It has its roots in some really sad parts of human history. My personal perspective is that I feel great shame for all the horrible things that people have done, not just the ones that look like me. I find it keeps me doing the right thing. But I don't personally believe that art and the expression of art belongs to anyone. My family is from Trinidad and Tobago. So can I only play Calypso music? You're going to relegate me to the music of the dirt my forefathers were born on? And say now that I play music that reminds people of the Beatles. Now I'm a thief of the English, who were supposedly thieves of the American, and it again and again and again until we get to Australopithecus? That's not appropriation, it's celebration of one another and growing together as one people. The alternative of that is artistic separatism, musical segregation, and it doesn't work for me. Well, being the inclusive person Paul was, he fancied inviting local musicians in Nigeria to play with him. But as the previous rant suggests, Paul was accused of trying to steal African music. Paul recalls this altercation by saying, We went there intending to use some of the local musicians. We thought we might have some African brass and drums and things. We started off thinking of doing a track with an African feel, or maybe a few tracks, or maybe even the whole album, using the local conga players and African fellows. But when we got there and we were looking around and watching the local bands, one of the fellows, fellow Ramsam Kuti, came up to us after a day or two and said, you're trying to steal the black musician's music. We said, no, we're not. Do us a favor, fella. We do all right as it is, actually. We'll sell a record here and there. We just want to use some of your guys. But he got heavy about it until in the end we thought, blow you then. We'll do it all ourselves. So we did. And the only guy from Africa we use, Remy Kabaka, was someone we met in London. Then we discovered that he came from Lagos. But that was purely coincidental. So it really does keep getting worse. Ironically, after being called a thief, guess what happens to Paul and Linda? They get mugged at knife point. Crazy, right? Paul tells the story quite well, saying, After we had been in Lagos a couple of weeks, we were held up and robbed at knife point. Linda and I had set off like a couple of tourists, loaded with tapes and cameras, to walk to Denny's house, which was about 20 minutes down the road. A car pulls up besides us and goes a little bit ahead. Then a guy gets out, and I thought that he wanted to give us a lift. So I said, listen, man, it's very nice of you. Thanks very much, but we're going to go for a walk. I patted him on the back, and he got back in the car, which went a little way up the road. It stopped again, and Linda was getting a bit worried. Then one of them, there were about five or six guys, rolled down the window and asked, are you a traveler? I still think that if I had said really quickly and said, yes, God's traveler, or something like that to freak them out a bit, maybe they would have left us alone. But I said, no, we are just out for a little walk. It's a holiday and we are tourists. Giving the whole game away. So with that, all of the doors of the car flew open and they all came out and one of them had a knife. Their eyes were wild and Linda was screaming, he's a musician, don't kill him. You know, all the unreasonable stuff you shout in situations like that. So I'm saying, what do you want, money? And they said, yeah, money. And I handed some over. 
We walked on home and we were just sitting down, having a cup of coffee and trying to recover our nerves, and there was a power cut. We thought they had come back and cut the power cables. We had a lot of trouble sleeping that night and got back to the studio the next day to be told, you're lucky to be alive. If you had been black, they'd have killed you, but as you're white, they know you won't recognize them. I wanted to call the police, but everyone said it would do no good there at all. With that, we had to carry on and make the record, adding to the pressure which we already got. Pretty scary, right? That's all, right? The album comes out and they make a bunch of money, yada, yada, yada. Nope. Paul freaking has a health crisis. I know, I didn't know any of this until I set out to make this video. It's crazy. He literally collapses outside of his studio, complaining about chest pains. He was only 31 years old. Paul remembers saying, it seemed stuffy in the studio, so I went outside for a breath of fresh air. If anything, the air was more foul outside than in. It was then that I began to feel a really terrible pain across the right side of my chest, and I collapsed. I could not breathe, and so I collapsed and fainted. Linda thought I had died. The doctor seemed to treat it pretty lightly and said it could be bronchial because I'd been smoking too much. But this was me in hell. I stayed in bed for a few days, thinking I was dying. It was one of the most frightening periods in my life. The climate, the tensions of making a record, which had just got to succeed, and being in this totally uncivilized part of the world finally got to me. Yikes, right? Well, you'll be glad to know that after that harrowing adventure, the album was recorded. Paul has long since quit smoking, and it's time for the cover art for the album, which is a more lovely and interesting story than you might presume. Fellow photographer Linda McCartney saw Clive Arrowsmith's pictures in Vogue magazine and invited him to create the cover of the Band on the Run album. Coincidentally, Arrowsmith had known the Beatles since their Quarrymen days. Arrowsmith says, there had been a few different ideas banging around when Paul came up with the concept of a jailbreak scene, which each of the escaping prisoners caught in the glare of a guard's spotlight. I remember shooting it against a wall of a 16th century Tudor mansion in West London, and I hired an old post van and put a theater light on top of it. The only problem was that the light wasn't that powerful, which affected the exposure and meant everyone had to strike a pose and hold it for a moment. On the cover, we can see the members of Wings, but also many famous people, including, wait for it, actor Christopher Lee. Paul had the guy who played Dracula, Count Dooku, and Sauron on his album. That's pretty far out. Before they did the shoot, Paul and Linda threw a party for all their esteemed guests, but sadly, Clive Arrowsmith didn't participate out of fear of getting drunk and screwing up the shoot. He actually did hilariously end up screwing it up anyway. Clive continues, I was the only one there who wasn't wasted. I was too scared. This was my first really big job, and the responsibility was way too great to join in the fun. I really didn't know what I was doing, and I used the wrong film, so all the pictures all came out yellow. On top of that, only about three of the shots weren't blurry from everyone moving about. So when it came to showing Paul, I was freaking out. Too much to say anything. I just held my breath. Of course, in the end, Paul must have quite liked it because it's the cover we now know and love. So let's go through it, shall we? We've got two members abandoning ship just before leaving for Africa. Monsoons in Africa, along with an insect infestation and constant power outages, Paul and Linda get robbed at knife point and Paul has a lung spell and collapses to the the ground. I don't know about you, but the pictures turning out a bit yellow was the least of Paul's issues. Paul was probably happy the picture didn't just up and stab him. But thankfully, the album released to glowing reviews and simply performed splendidly in the charts, although a bit slow on the uptake. Well, that's it for today, everyone. Man, that was a ton of fun to make. I love when the stories aren't just like, here are the facts, but really paint a picture and take us to places we didn't expect. I'll see you soon again.